watch the Iran Contra hearings? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Portions of it. I watched it for a few days. I watched a lot of it. My husband was addicted to it. I watched very little of it, but I, I did follow it very closely, yes. Do you think they're telling the truth? No. No, not really. Not the whole truth. I think they're under oath, so I think they're telling the truth. They couldn't remember. They all had lobotomies. That nobody could remember anything. You talk about senility. Holy cow. They were lying about most everything. There is a lot more to the story, but whether or not we'll ever find out about it is another question. What you saw in the Iran-Contra hearings was the exposure of the beginnings of a national security state which believes it has the right to override the Constitution of the United States in the name of security. I think that um, there was a substantial shadow government trying to run foreign affairs for the United States. In any other country, it would have been called a coup. Um, and they seem to have gotten away with it. I'd hate to think, as many of my colleagues here have already expressed themselves, that in the process, we have shredded our own democratic fabric. These are modern-day pirates, these guys. They have escaped, essentially, the control of national governments, but they're available for use by national governments. Sometimes they move under color of uh, you know, and defend themselves as advancing U.S. national interests in this. But I, uh, I think that's very secondary with these guys. They're out to make a buck. I did do it. I am not, as I said in my statement, at all ashamed of any of the things that I did. I was given a mission, and I tried to carry it out. The Iran-Contra hearings, convened in May 1987, by a special joint committee of the United States Congress to investigate the sale of U.S. weapons to Iran and the illegal diversion of money to the Contras. For 13 weeks, the hearings were broadcast on national television. Over 30 people testified, and the committee issued a 700-page report of its findings. But there are still many important questions that the select committee left unanswered and unexplored. Often, the official explanation seemed inadequate and contradictory. Our government has a firm policy not to capitulate to terrorist demands, that no concessions policy remains in force, in spite of the wildly speculative and false stories about arms for hostages and alleged ransom payments. We did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages, nor will we. Despite Reagan's denials, investigations soon revealed that arms had been traded for hostages held in the Mideast. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. Only days later, it was further revealed that the arms to Iran had been severely marked up. Some of the profits had been illegally diverted to support the Contras, a guerrilla force organized by the CIA fighting the Nicaraguan government. The Reagan administration had a major scandal on its hands. Been going on that had been kept from me in various covert Mr. operations. President, did they deceive you? You didn't answer whether Point, uh, Point Dexter and North deceived you. We had weapons being sold by the Pentagon under the Economy Act to the CIA, and the CIA selling them to a third party or an agent, in the case of General Secord, who would then complete the transaction. I'm just trying to find out where the authorities were coming from to do these activities. I mean, clearly, there was no congressional oversight over this because it was kept 
totally hidden from the Congress. From whom would you have to get the green light in order to make the request or the direction, I take it, to C-Court to move ahead? Well, as I have testified, Senator, I talked to Director Casey, I talked to Mr. McFarland, I talked to uh, Admiral Poindexter. The use of U.S. government money for supporting the overthrow of the Nicaraguan government was specifically prohibited when Congress enacted the Boland Amendment in 1984. Even though it remained in effect until 1986, millions of dollars in profits from Iranian arms sales were secretly diverted to the Contras during this period through contacts with middlemen such as Moniker Gorbanifar. Mr. Gorbanifar took me into the bathroom and Mr. Gorbanifar suggested several incentives to make that February transaction work. And the, the attractive incentive for me was the one he made that residuals could flow to support the Nicaraguan resistance. Even Gorbanifar knew that you were supporting the Contras. Yes, he did. Izvestia knew it. The name had been in the papers in Moscow. It had been all over Danny Ortega's newscast. Radio Havana was broadcasting it. It was in the, every newspaper in the land. All our enemies knew it, and you wanted to conceal it from the United States Congress. We wanted to be able to deny a covert operation. Did these hearings uncover the full story behind the Contragate scandal? Or was it merely an attempt to keep the real truth hidden from public view? Peter Dale Scott, professor at the University of California at Berkeley, has conducted extensive research on covert action and CIA activities. The results are detailed in his book, The Iran-Contra Connection. I think the real issue was that uh, both uh, the, the administration and the majority of the people in the committees were frightened that the real scandals, the drug scandals, for example, would really threaten the, 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 any future conduct of covert operations on the scale that they had been handled in the past. And so they were trying very deliberately to limit the damage. This was damage control. Look only at the Iran arms sales and the alleged diversion to the Contras. The American people may very well feel that the important questions didn't get asked so they don't have the whole picture. They have a few little transactions and nauseating detail on those few transactions, but they, but they were cheated out of the whole bowl of wax. And so they were pulling their punches on all the major questions and issues of what, was really, what really happened in this thing, what the CIA's role was. Anytime they got into anything that was really sensitive about exactly that, exactly what the CIA's role was and exactly what laws were broken and when, they went into secret session, which means that we the people won't be, you know, we won't ever know. Like you, I do not wish to see secrets of this land inadvertently and accidentally made public. Accordingly, the panel will enter into executive session. In addition to facts that were hidden from the public through secrecy and executive sessions, other evidence was simply destroyed. When you got back to examining what they had done, they systematically destroyed and shredded all of the documentation, as much as they could get. Hours of, of shredding. Altered some of the documents that remained. Stole what they couldn't shred. Now this gives you an indication that there may be a, a few things they did that they didn't want the public to know. I shredded. I was never told not to shred. I shredded because I thought it was the right thing to do. When I didn't have a shredder, I put it in a burn bag and they were burned. Weren't you going through your files to get rid of embarrassing documents? Embarrassing? No. Documents that would compromise the national security of the United States, documents that would put lives at risk, documents that would demonstrate a covert action in U.S. direction and, and control and... and relationship to it yes are you embarrassing no I, I don't my memory is very unclear about how the shredding incident started I believe as I said my memory is that he began pulling documents and I joined him 
And did you surmise that this was a, a way of trying to, to cover up something in conjunction with the Iran initiative or the Contra initiative? I don't use the word cover up, I would use the word protect. Why do you think we sold arms to Iran? Iran, uh, well, to, for, to get the hostages out, strictly to get the hostages out. I think some people really believe that there were moderate elements there that might, you know, help us in the future. But I really think their main focus was uh, to free the hostages. They say it was to help the Contras in Nicaragua, but I don't believe that's true. It was to get the money, I believe. And that reason could be anything. They, I mean, they can tell us anything on TV. Iran is a crucial economic, geographic country. The U.S. wants to uh, get them friendly again as quickly as possible. Perhaps the most explosive issue that was not investigated in the hearings was the true nature of the arrangement with Iran. When did the U.S. actually begin selling weapons to Iran, and why? The most important thing to come out of the hearings is what didn't even get asked at the hearings, and that was Ronald Reagan cut a deal with Iran before the 1980 election to send arms to Iran in exchange for Iran's agreeing to delay the release of our 52 hostages. Barbara Honegger was a dedicated member of the Reagan-Bush presidential campaign in 1980. She worked on the special writing, research, and policy staff, and later as a White House policy analyst. As part of my position, I was required to cover the 11 o'clock evening news in the operations center. The campaign was afraid that Jimmy Carter would successfully bring the 52 hostages home, what we call the October surprise, and win the election. There had been a feeling of panic in the campaign. The 56 hostages taken captive at the U.S. Embassy in Iran in 1979 became a major issue in Jimmy Carter's campaign for re-election to a second term as president. His repeated efforts to gain their release failed, and Ronald Reagan was elected by a wide margin. After 14 months in captivity, the hostages were finally released, January 21st, 1981, the day of Ronald Reagan's inauguration. Now working as a private investigator, Barbara Honegger has researched the hostage question carefully. According to reports gathered from a number of sources, she has distilled the following information. There were two meetings that we know of for certain to date that happened, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Paris, France, before the 1980 election in October of 1980, where George Bush, then vice presidential candidate, Richard Allen, who became Reagan's first national security advisor, Donald Gregg, who became Bush's national security advisor and still is, passed millions of dollars to the Iranians to delay the release of our 52 hostages an additional 76 days. They met with an emissary of the Khomeini regime who offered a deal that they thought Reagan and Bush could not refuse, and that was we will delay the release of the 52 hostages if you will promise us all the arms that we could possibly want in the war against Iraq once you become president of the United States. The man who was president of Iran during the hostage crisis was Abul Hassan Banisadr. He was later ousted in a coup and is now living in exile in Paris. Banisadr supports the charges that a deal was made with the Reagan-Bush campaign to delay the hostages' release. In a recent interview, he confirms that the Paris meeting took place and states that George Bush was specifically identified as being at the meeting by Iranian intelligence reports. Also identified were Moniker Gobanifar and Albert Hakim, who later emerged as key middlemen in the Iran-Contra scandal. As evidence of this agreement, Bani Sadr has made documents available showing written orders for shipment of American parts and weapons to Iran through an Israeli-owned company. And in fact, we now know that those arms began flowing in late February, early March of 1981. Not as the White House would have you believe in 1985. I want to get to the bottom of this and find out all that has happened. And so far, I've told you all that I know, and you know the truth of the matter is, for quite some long time, all that you knew was what I told you. The bottom line is that the Iran-Contra Committee 
and the Walsh investigation, because their mandates only take us back to 1984, in and of themselves are a cover-up. But the problem of hostages did not go away for President Reagan. Radical elements in Middle Eastern countries continued to kidnap Americans during Reagan's term of office. We're going to continue to explore, as we always have, every opportunity to try and get them out. I happen to believe that when an American citizen, any place in the world, is unjustly denied their constitutional rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the responsibility of this government to restore those rights. One of the hostages taken in Lebanon in March 1984 was Jerry Levin. His wife, Sis Levin, became increasingly frustrated with Reagan's lack of action to gain her husband's release. The word sent to the hostage families constantly was, he was too busy to even see us. We had no access. We had no task force. We had no hearings in Congress. All of those things were denied us. We were simply told to stay home, to be quiet, to trust, and the agenda will be fulfilled. Now we know the agenda was to Iran. After seven months, Sis Levin finally traveled to the Mideast to gain her husband's release. He was later allowed to escape as a result of her negotiations with the Syrian government. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back. Her experience has led her to doubt the Reagan administration's motives. The claim on the part of the government was that the administration was so anxious about the hostage situation that they were pressured into giving arms to the Ayatollah to bring the hostages out. Many of us think in looking at it that if there had not been hostages, they would have had to have been created. Because if the agenda to, to get arms to Iran were discovered, the only thing the American people would take as an excuse would be the very human element of a very human president weeping over hostages. The Reagan-Bush administration, right from the beginning, behind the scenes, has been an ally of the Khomeini regime because Ronald Reagan's number one fear is the Soviet invasion of Iran. It's that simple. I must confess to you that I thought using the Ayatollah's money to support the Nicaraguan resistance was a right idea. I was not the only one who was enthusiastic about this idea. Director Casey referred to, to it as the ultimate irony, uh, the ultimate covert operation. There was a lot of talk during the hearings about covert operations, national security, the necessity of secrecy in conducting foreign policy. But some experts claim that covert action does not work in the interest of the U.S. national security, nor does it create a more stable world. To think of the democratic governments that have been overthrown uh, in the last 30 years by military coups is almost like giving a capsule history of CIA covert operations in the last 30 years. I mean, there, there was the overthrow of Prime Minister Mossadegh in, uh, in Iran in 1953. There was the overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954. There was the um, overthrow of the Brazilian government in 1964. There was the overthrow of the Ghana government in 1966. A lot of the governments I've just mentioned got into trouble with the international oil companies because they tried to assert their national prerogatives over their own resources. Time after time, the CIA has come in on behalf of those multinational companies. You start a huge covert war that you intend is going to be secret. It's not secret from the Russians, certainly not secret from the Laotians who are getting shot at, or the Angolans, or the Nicaraguans, or whoever it is. It's covert from the American taxpayer and voter. 
and uh, a lot of people make a lot of money off of it. Um, and it attracts criminals, and it has every single time. Who are the names, the faces, behind these covert activities? Some, like Oliver North, General Secord, Albert Hakim, are practically household names. But Daniel Sheehan, chief legal counsel for the Christic Institute, a public interest law firm, believes there are other influential players involved. There exists, in operation now, a secret team of some two dozen men, former Central Intelligence Agency covert operatives, former U.S. Pentagon arms suppliers, who have joined together in a private enterprise outside of the control of the American government, either the Congress or the President, who are mounting their personal wars around the world. Whether there is actually an organized secret team or simply a loose association of individuals, it is clear that there are a number of people who have been working actively behind the scenes in these covert operations. Some of the names are Theodore Shackley, who was Assistant Deputy Director of Operations for the Central Intelligence Agency as of 1976 under George Bush, who was CIA director at the time. Thomas Kleins, who worked as a case officer under Shackley in Miami and in Laos. Rafael Chichi Quintero, an anti-Castro Cuban who worked under Kleins and was allegedly recruited by the CIA as an assassin. General John Singlaub, who worked with Shackley and Kleins in Vietnam and was in charge of the CIA's special operations over the border into Laos. General Richard Secord, who supervised the air operations into Laos and was later assigned to the Pentagon, where he was put in charge of arms sales to Iran. Albert Hakim, who was a salesman for U.S. weapons companies and a middleman in the Iran-Contra affair. These are the men who have been stirring the, the pot around the world to instigate these wars uh, on the, the side of the right wing. And that's the group that we're dealing with right here, who are making war around the world for their own personal profit. Cuban revolutionary troops such as these have invaded Castro's leftist island fortress, reportedly rallied by a mysterious coded radio message. Alert, alert. From the sea and it was after the failed invasion of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs in 1961 that Theodore Shackley, as CIA station chief in Miami and his assistant, Thomas Kleins, began working with Rafael Quintero and other right-wing Cubans to overthrow the Castro government. In 1965, Shackley and Kleins were transferred to Laos, where Shackley became CIA station chief, Kleins his assistant once again. It was here in Southeast Asia that they teamed up with General Secord and Singlau. And they there began running the secret war in Laos and Cambodia and Thailand. Uh, everybody in the United States basically thought the war was going on in Vietnam. In fact, there was a major dirty war, covert war, that was fought primarily through assassinations uh, of people that were suspected sympathizers of the path at Lao or other people who were not terribly sympathetic to the Western powers. When Theodore Shackley was promoted to director of CIA Western Hemisphere Operations, he supervised the plans to overthrow the democratically elected president of Chile, Salvador Allende. Allende, a socialist, had promised to nationalize the copper mines and other industries and posed a threat to U.S. business interests in Chile. After a bloody coup, Allende was replaced by a right-wing military dictator, Augusto Pinochet, whose security forces brutally murdered and tortured thousands of political dissidents. Shackley moved on, returning to Southeast Asia. By that time, the writing was on the wall. The United States was going to be pushed out of Southeast Asia. It was clear that the, that the Viet Cong were going to prevail under Ho Chi Minh. And so what these men began to do, they began to pilfer hundreds of tons of ammunition and military equipment out of Vietnam, they began to construct a covert war capacity. 
that was unknown to the United States Congress, that didn't require supervision by the President, but would pursue the mission that they viewed as their ultimate mission. And that is to attempt to vanquish any people who didn't support the United States foreign policy and who were socialist or communist anywhere in the world. But then came Watergate, a president forced to resign, and the American people, disillusioned by White House corruption and lies, wanted a change. In 1976, Jimmy Carter was elected president. He and new CIA director Stansfield Turner began to clean house, pushing out nearly 800 men from CIA covert operations. When all these covert operators were fired in the 1970s, they didn't just start uh, opening restaurants or working in bookstores. They were people who were very skilled in uh, covert manipulation of political process. And they essentially ganged up to uh, find and then elect a candidate who would put them back in the covert operations business. And Reagan and Bush were only too eager to be that kind of candidate. In the late 70s, Shackley, Kleins, and Secord worked together in a company called Eatsco. Eatsco was formed in order to ship weapons from the U.S. to Egypt. As in the Iran sales, large profits were taken from these deals. The man who provided the financing for Eatsco was Edwin Wilson. Shackley and Kleins and Quintero, who used to visit my farm out there in Virginia, saw that, uh, you know, I guess I was prosperous, and if I could do it, obviously they could do it, and they figured they would like, as soon as, soon as they left the, the government, to get involved in business with me. In 1983, Wilson was convicted of supplying arms to Libyan President Muammar Gaddafi. Now serving 52 years in federal prison, Wilson asserts that he has merely taken the fall for his superiors and ex-business partners Theodore Shackley and Thomas Kleins. Kleins was getting out of CIA and so was Shackley and so I would fund an organization and these people would all be in it. So it was Kleins, Shackley, Secord, Van Marbon and myself, five of us, uh, five of us would have this organization. It would be with 20% each of it. I would fund it for $500,000. What's important about this Eatsco company is that it's a kind of precedent in the Ed Wilson style for the Hakim Secord enterprise in the Iran-Contra affair. You have a government-arranged sale of arms, and people with connections to the government get to move the arms. They rip off the government for a very hefty profit or surplus. It was done in the case of Eatsco by Kleins and company, and it was done in the Iran-Contra affair by Secord and Hakim. As private businessmen and government operatives, Shackley, Kleins, and Secord, along with Wilson and middleman Albert Hakim, turned their attention to the Mideast. They supplied arms to Mideast governments while skimming off huge profits into hidden bank accounts around the world. They secretly supplied weapons and military intelligence to Nicaraguan dictator Anastasio Somoza and helped the Shah of Iran eliminate his enemies. There is an early bond between Iran and Nicaragua. The bond is this secret team of men. So throughout that period from October of 1977 to December of 1978, this secret team has two major operations, one to support the Shah, the other to support the right-wing dictator Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua. The, this was their world at that time. The Shah collapses in December of 78, and Anastasio Somoza collapses in July of 1979. After the overthrow of Somoza, many of his former National Guardsmen fled to Honduras, where they were organized and trained by the CIA as a counter-revolutionary force to fight against the new government in Nicaragua. They began to create the Contras, to try to do the identical thing that was done by the supporters of Batista against the Cuban revolutionary government back in 1959. Not an indigenous force inside Nicaragua that had any support from any of the population in Nicaragua. It was a total artifice that was created by these men.
These are young men and women who gave up everything they had and they fled a totalitarian communist regime. And they fled to another country because they could no longer live within the one that they'd been born in. And they took up arms. I didn't create the Nicaraguan Contra or the Nicaraguan Freedom Fighter. And the CIA didn't create it. The Sandinistas created it. One of the original Contra political leaders was Edgar Chamorro. He joined the Contras in 1981. I became involved with the Contras because the CIA, using people from the White House, they invited me to be one of, of the Contra leaders. Uh, I, I was told that the, this was just a, a war for a year, that the United States wanted to put this pressure on Nicaragua. But then after a year or so, I found out that uh, this was not the case. We were being used to deceive uh, the American people. We were used to, to lie to Congress by going to tell Congress uh, that the purpose was a good purpose to bring democracy, but in private we were, telling, uh, we were being told something different. So I felt that this was a big lie. After several years with the Contras, Chamorro became disillusioned with CIA influence on the Contra movement and quit. Still a critic of some Sandinista policies, he is yet a harsher critic of the Contras. The tactics used by the Contras were tactics of uh, terrorizing civilians, making uh, situations where civilians were uh, getting, getting killed. Nicaragua, under President Reagan, they are in fact giving the Contras written instructions in violence and destabilization. The target is the people. Uh, the, the social and economic infrastructure is what you're hitting at. It's not a bloodbath. It's like you go into a village and you kill a few people to make your point. The purpose is to disseminate terror traumatize the people. We're not killing Sandinistas in the capital. We're not blowing up their homes and terrorizing them. We're hitting at the people throughout the interior of the country. In addition to the terrorist tactics used by the Contras, there was corruption. Substantial portions of both congressional funds and privately raised monies were never accounted for. Traveler's checks raise the question in relative to the Contras. The soldier in the field can't cash a traveler's check. But we used to purchase Cordobas for them. Well, there are $3 million in traveler's checks. Naturally raises suspicions. After a while, they get used to fat pays, you know, have heavy uh, income and good salaries and uh, per diems and uh, many other privileges. So it was a, a way to be big shots again, uh, fat cuts, and they were not really interested in the Nicaraguan people. Well, we know that huge amounts of money are missing. Uh, we know that there were bribes, of the millions of dollars given to the Honduran officers. We know that at a time when the United States government was paying for complete rations for the troops, that the, that the Contra troops were living on one meal a day. There have been a lot of allegations thrown around that uh, the Contra resupply oper operation was involved in cocaine trafficking. We found absolutely no evidence during my tenure at the NSC that any of the resistance leaders were in themselves or their subordinates involved in drug running. Although there was enough evidence to warrant investigation into CIA drug trafficking, there was no serious interest on the part of committee members, and no first-hand witnesses were called. At one point, the hearings were disrupted by two observers who burst out in protest.
For these actions, the protesters were handed down stiff jail sentences of over a year each. They never got into drugs. Um, even though it kept coming up in their face, they, they had got declassified a lot of memos from Robert Owen in which he was telling Oliver North that there were Contra leaders who were in, involved in the drug traffic. The only questions they allowed on this was to sort of smooth it over or to blame it on somebody else. A news program over the weekend suggested that Rob Owen, who testified earlier, was involved in drug smuggling. Now, is there any truth to that? Uh, can you shed any light for us on that subject? Absolutely false. Uh, Mr. Owen is the last person, perhaps right beside me, that would ever be engaged in those kinds of activities. In, in the early 1980s, when the CIA was working to establish a southern front in Costa Rica in the war against Nicaragua, a relationship was established with John Hull, an American rancher living in Costa Rica. There is mounting evidence that the airstrips on Hull's ranch became not only a delivery point for illegal Contra weapon shipments from the U.S., but were also used for transporting cocaine into the United States. You have CI bases in Costa Rica and Honduras. You have airplanes flying back and forth continuously, landing at bases in the United States uh, where they don't have to go through regular customs, with the CI escorting the people in and out in a certain uh, laissez-faire in the attitude at best of the customs if there is you know, any customs representation there. So it's a dream situation for drug smugglers. George Morales, who is now serving 32 years in federal prison for drug smuggling, once ran an air transport business in Florida. In 1984, while under indictment for smuggling marijuana, he was approached by the CIA. You have to understand what situation. I was, uh, I was in the business, drug business, for a long time. And I did have no need for me to go to Costa Rica in order to fly back to the United States. Being in Colombia, it's very easy for me to go down there and get my connections and bring the cocaine back straight from Colombia. I got involved with these people in 1984, after, right after my indictment. They approached me with different questions to how to help the, 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 the fight against the communists, because I was going to get in exchange for my help I was going to get uh, some uh, type of uh, deal, let me put it that way, in which they were going to be able to take care of my legal problem. They told me that they were going to go on to Washington and talk to these people in Washington. And in many occasions, they told me the name of, the name of Elio Abrams and George Bush. They had some drugs, cocaine, in San Jose, Costa Rica, which they needed to bring it back to the United States. I was told to send the planes with the supplies to his ranch, which we did. And we came back with some drugs from Costa Rica. Did you come back with cocaine? Yes, we came out, we came back with the cocaine. Gary Betzner, who is also serving time for drug smuggling, worked as a pilot for George Morales. Uh, George said he wanted me to uh, fly a couple loads of guns and, and bring a coke back from Costa Rica. And he gave me the directions to uh, John Hull's ranch, mm -hmm. who's a CIA operative in Costa Rica. I left approximately midnight, arrived at uh, John Hull's ranch about 7 o'clock in the morning, offloaded the guns, loaded 500 keys of cocaine on the plane. I gassed the aircraft myself, loaded it and departed. And each time I did it, I paid myself uh, 20 kilos, which is approximately 400,000. Eventually, when this was brought to the attention of the FBI and the assistant U U.S. attorney in Miami, uh, they went down and uh, conducted some kind of investigation of this. Hull's name came up. Hull refused to be interviewed. Hull uh, and his friends phoned Washington uh, Washington al uh, alerted Oliver North. Oliver North uh, somehow got uh, the Justice Department in Washington to phone down to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami 
And uh, apparently the U.S. attorney was told to go very slow on his investigation. But CIA involvement in the drug business did not start in Central America. It dates back at least as far as the Vietnam War. Well, the three men, uh, Shackley and Singlaub and Secord, were all working together from different countries on the huge CIA secret war in Laos. Our allies were the opium-growing tribesmen, and this meant that we continued in a very large way not only to support but really to augment a flow of heroin. This had to be run with the knowledge and the approval of the people who were in charge of these air operations. And uh, these air operations had been controlled in the 66-68 period by General Secord. The way the dynamics worked is that you're a young or middle grade case officer, uh, our pilot on Air America, the CIA Airlines or CAT, Civil Air Transport, and this general and his family or his aides get on the plane and they have suitcases that you know damn well is full of heroin. Now, you don't really have the authority to throw them off. It's kind of more their country than yours. And if you do, you're going to lose your job and have the whole weight of the CIA coming down on you. Whereas if you just smile and fly them and then get them down to the base in wh whatever capital you're going to and take them through customs if necessary, help them through, uh, you know, you're doing your job, you're making money, no questions asked. Despite our best efforts, illegal cocaine is coming into our country at alarming levels, and four to five million people regularly use it. 500,000 Americans are hooked on heroin. One in 12 persons smokes marijuana regularly. Our job is never easy because drug criminals are ingenious. They work every day to plot a new and better way to steal our children's lives, just as they've done by developing this new drug crack. For every door that we close, they open a new door to death. This administration is impossible to embarrass to begin with. I mean, they rely on the old rule of deny, 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 despite the, you know, the vast amounts of evidence that is available. And as we talked earlier, there is the tendency within the Congress and within large sections of, first of all, the establishment media you know, simply to reject this sort of thing. It can't be happening. If Nancy Reagan is saying just no to drugs, you know, how can, you know, drugs be running by the same freedom fighters that she embraces at uh, various banquets? The weapons trade and the narcotics trade in the world are two of the top five major money-making transactions in the whole world. These two major commodities in the world are hundreds of billions of dollars that go on. They could, they could pay the money of the national debt for whole countries. In fact, Jorge Ochoa and Pablo Escobar agreed to pay the entire national debt of Colombia if, in fact, Colombia would agree not to allow them to be extradited. And it would still leave both of these guys multi-billionaires. So the amount of money that we're talking about here is absolutely gargantuan. In all that the intelligence community, these guys have brought outside the, the governmental structures, are tapping into hundreds of millions, which they need to run their operations. Now let's talk about profits. There's been testimony that Mr. Hakim and Secord we're reaping large profits by marking up the arms being sold to the Contras. For example, Mr. Secord agreed to a suggestion of Tom Klein's that they maximize the profits from the last sale of arms to the Contras. Were you aware of that? No. How much money, according to your understanding, did Mr. Secord take from the sale of arms to Iran? I still don't know. I don't even know that he did. Was it your understanding that there was $8 million either in Swiss bank accounts or in investment accounts at CSF? No, sir. Money is the gal. Grab that cash in both hands and make a stash. 
facts are that uh, Secord and North and Hakim are wonderful operators of a secret war, of a shadow government, uh, of operating for a shadow government, are people who still have control of $8 million of United States money, our money, and they are controlling it, got it rocked up in a uh, Swiss bank somewhere, or off on a CD somewhere else. Corruption, blatant violations of U.S. law, and drug running are not the only means to a political end. There is mounting evidence that assassinations, even of Americans, are not out of the question. Now, Mr. Owen, you were in uh, Central America in May of 1984 when a bombing attack was undertaken on the headquarters of then uh, former Contra leader Eden Pastora. Is that yes, correct? Sir. Yes, sir, I was. I was down there on a survey for Colonel North. I had a meeting that night with John Hull and also with the senior CIA official in that government, or excuse me, in that country. Um, we discussed what was going on. Uh, and I just was shocked, as everyone else was, when we learned about 3.30 in the morning when some of the Nicaraguans came to the apartment and talked with us and told us what had happened. Uh, John Hull has been accused of masterminding it or being involved in it. That's absolutely scurrilous as well. And I'm saying this under oath. The 1984 bombing at the Penca Nicaragua killed eight people and injured 25 others. Among those killed was American journalist Linda Frazier. The intended victim, Contra leader Eden Pastora, escaped with only minor injuries. But some people started asking, who would want to kill Pastora, and why? Eden Pastora, who was the famous Comandante Zero, a major military commander and hero of the Sandinista peasant revolution, against Anastasio Somoza, the dictator in Nicaragua, had become growingly disenchanted with the, the revolutionary government, the coalition government in Nicaragua. In 1982, he left Nicaragua and went to Costa Rica. His purpose was to organize a genuinely indigenous group of Nicaraguans to undertake a political and military resistance to the Nicaraguan government. Tony Avergan, freelance journalist and news cameraman was working for ABC News in Costa Rica during the Pastora controversy. Pastora had received an ultimatum uh, from the Central Intelligence Agency saying that you must accept unity with the largest contra group, the FDN, or face a cutoff in aid and unspecified consequences. He called this news conference uh, for the purpose of uh, saying that he would not give in to this demand and uh, that he would never accept unity with the, the FDN and uh, basically to tell the CIA to go to hell. Because of moral reasons, because of political and ideological reasons, we could not unify, become allies with the historical murderers of our people. The international media was invited to this press conference held at Pastora's contrabase camp just inside the Nicaraguan border at La Penca. Tony Avergan was one of the journalists who made the trip upriver to hear Pastora. It was just a, a very, very routine day. I myself had made at least a dozen, maybe 15 trips to contra camps in southern Nicaragua, and this was just one more, and I, I thought absolutely nothing of it. I mean, didn't think there was any, any danger involved, you know, whatsoever. So we got there at about 7 o'clock in the evening, and uh, we went up to this cottage, and Pastora was there. So very soon he started talking with us. A girl came in and offered him some coffee. Some seconds afterwards, or maybe one minute afterwards, the bomb exploded. Yo, sencilla y llanamente, con los que asesinaron a mi pueblo, con los que asesinaron a mi padre, con los que... I felt my, my hair and my skin on fire, and I thought it had only happened to me, and I fell forward onto the floor trying to put out the, the fire, and 
almost as soon as I hit the floor, I, I realized that it, it wasn't just me. After more than 12 hours, the injured journalists finally arrived at the hospital in Quesada, Costa Rica. Tony Avergon's wife, Martha Honey, also a journalist, was at the hospital. I noticed as we came out of the emergency door that there was this person sitting there who I asked the nurses, who is that? And they said, oh, that's Per Anker Hansen, a Danish journalist. And he was sitting in um, hospital garb, but obviously, you know, only slightly, if at all, injured, and sitting there chain-smoking, very calm, just kind of watching what was going on. And what we later learned was that he had left the hospital and had gone back to his hotel, checked out, and vanished. And that was the last that any of us ever saw of him. After Abagon's recovery, he and Martha Honey began an investigation of the bombing incident. They found that the bomb had been made with C4, a very powerful explosive. They also discovered that the mysterious Danish journalist named Per Anka Hansen was in fact a Makgalil, who is thought to be a right-wing anti-Qaddafi Libyan. The investigation revealed that Galil had also worked with the secret police in Chile. It soon became clear that Galil was not acting alone. The action is well done, it's very precise, and uh, we didn't get to Peran Hassan. never, we didn't get to him. That means that he has a very good network to help him. That is the reason why I think there's an organized crime there. I don't care if it is left or right. I think there is a network behind Per Anker Hansen. We began quite early on to collect information about what we call the intellectual authors, the people, the team behind the bomber. And um, I think within, oh, about, about two months, it became pretty clear to us that what we were looking at was a group of people which included some Cuban Americans from Miami, this fellow John Hull here, who works for the CIA in northern Costa Rica, uh, some of the top leadership of the Contra organization, the FDN, including Adolfo Calero, and um, some, some other people leading up towards the White House. They are the same forces, the Counter Revolution supervised by Senor Calero and sections of the CIA and the National Security Council, conducted by Mr. Maroney, whose other name is Dewey Claridge, in the Central Intelligence Agency, and in the National Security Council, conducted by Colonel Oliver North. They were the ones interested, or the ones in whose interest it would be, to eliminate the southern forces, or to eliminate us. The evidence now is is a matter of public record that uh, Secord and Kleins and Hakim and Rafael Chichi Quintero, at least, were directly involved in supplying the military equipment, including the C4 explosives that were going into Costa Rica to John Hull's ranch. And we have placed John Hull, by direct eyewitness accounts, physically in the company of Per Anker Hansen, or Amat Gilel, prior to the bombing, in the presence of the metal suitcase that had the C4 in it. I, I, have, no, I have no idea who placed the bomb in the Pinica or why. I have no idea. I only know that this Honey and Avergon have constantly bribed people to give false information implicating the CIA, the Costa Rican officials, and so forth. If the CIA has the capacity, if they wanted to kill somebody, they wouldn't have to kill a bunch of, of innocent uh, press people. That's, that's logical. And they have no need, to, they had no need to kill. What, what would the CIA gain by, by uh, Eden Pastora being dead? We're convinced from the interviews that we did that targeting the American press, the American journalists who went to La Penca, was one of the specific objects. They wanted Americans to die. They succeeded. They killed Linda Frazier. And that this was one of the plans because the plan was to blame this bombing on the Sandinistas and try to turn American public opinion and the American press against the Sandinistas. Following their investigation, Avagon and Honey filed a $20 million lawsuit against the group they feel is responsible for the Lepenka bombing. Representing them 
In this potentially explosive case is Daniel Sheehan and the Christic Institute, a public interest law firm that has successfully prosecuted cases involving Karen Silkwood, Three Mile Island, and the Ku Klux Klan in Greensboro, North Carolina. The defendants in the Lepenka suit include Theodore Shackley, Thomas Kleins, General Secord, and others with connections to the CIA and the White House. You've spoken very highly of Thomas Kleins and, and Raphael Quintero. Yes, sir. And you indicated that you'd use the services of both in your Contra or Iran project, some of them. Well, as you are no doubt aware, you and Thomas Kleins and Raphael Quintero and others have been sued in federal court in Florida for a vast array of alleged illegal and corrupt practices beginning as far back as 1960. Did you know about that? Uh, of course I know about it. Well, the allegations include the organization of assassination program funded by the drug king pen in Laos and laundering of millions of dollars of, of dollars skimmed from sale of military weapons to the Shah of Iran, and, and they've got the provision of military services to Somoza and laundering Colombian drug money. This suit, which was filed uh, in May of last year, uh, is uh, the most outrageous fairy tale anybody's ever read. Uh, nobody, including uh, the Justice Department, credits it at all. Uh, it's being dealt with. Uh, I can only fight on so many fronts at once. Uh, I regard that one as a rather minor threat, which will be tossed out of court shortly. Thank you very much. Uh, the hearing will stand in recess until 2 p.m. this afternoon. Clearly, the Reagan administration, in its policy with respect to Nicaragua, has again and again taken the position that the end justifies the means. They'll, they're perfectly happy to subvert domestic law, international law, uh, because they have uh, a higher goal in their own minds, and that is to fight communism. Now, if we don't support the Nicaraguan democratic resistance and ignore the communist threat that exists right now in Central America, what, in your opinion, what, you, what in your opinion do you think might happen in the next 20 years in this hemisphere and maybe throughout the world? It won't take 20 years, Senator. It will take a whole lot less. The consolidation of the communist regime in Managua will result in the spread of that revolution, as they themselves have advocated. You will see democracy perish in the rest of Central America. If the communists get control of Central America, which I assure you they will if we leave Nicaragua as a base for the Cubans and the Russians, then they'll be in a position to throw 50 or 80 million refugees into the United States, they can break our economy and never fire a shot. If you deeply believe that this is a communist menace that is going to march from Nicaragua up to Texas and uh, Topeka and soon take over the United States, um, maybe it would justify the means. But if you look back over the history of this thing, each one of these crises has not. Look at Angola. We were told 10 years ago that if we allowed a Marxist government to take over in Angola, we'd never get another oil tanker out of the Persian Gulf, but they would disrupt the sea lanes. Well, the Marxist government did take over in Angola. We were told that if we lost Vietnam and Indochina, that the whole row of dominoes would fall. What were the results? When we lose the war, all the dominoes that were supposed to fall, instead of falling, they become, in, uh, just a few years later, what the World Bank, our own institution, calls the economically strongest uh, area, region in the world. Counsel, I don't believe that anyone who served in, in Vietnam, who saw what happened as a consequence of our efforts, when, in my opinion, we won all the battles and then lost the war, could ever be unaffected by that unless they were totally insensitive. Can I would also point out that we didn't lose the war in Vietnam. We lost the war right here in this city. Well, what North was saying there was that America's real enemies are inside this country. And that would explain why North spent so many years under Bush's auspices preparing contingency plans for rounding up large numbers of dissenters if we ever go into another war. Now, you would have thought that the committee would have been outraged by North's sort of declaration of war with a large segment of the American people, but instead of their disagreeing with them, most of them actually agreed with him.
The fear of an enemy within is not new in American government. In 1942, amidst the hysteria following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, over 100,000 Americans of Japanese descent were rounded up and put into mass prison camps. They were accused of no crime, given no trial, but remained incarcerated for several years. This internment of Japanese Americans is thought by many to be one of the darkest moments in American history. But could it happen again? Concomitant with this whole operation and Oliver North's involvement in it was a plan to suspend the United States Constitution, as they referred to it, in, under a state of national emergency on the part of the president. Where that comes from is a specific program uh, called Rex 84, Readiness Exercise, number 84, or for 1984. And it was undertaken under the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Now, this was a, a national executive branch agency that was originally set up at the very end of the Carter administration to do nothing more than to coordinate the national flood relief, hurricane relief, Red Cross stuff, things, to get the, the government programs all brought under one umbrella so they could coordinate them. When Reagan was elected to the presidency, he installed Louis Giafrida as head of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Giafrida was an old, cold warrior from Reagan's California days whose specialty was suppression of unrest and dissent. Giafrida, North, and George Bush began to turn FEMA into an instrument of domestic anti-terrorism. You're dealing with a group of people in the Reagan administration who equated political dissent with treason and who cannot differentiate between emergency procedures, which I think everyone agrees are necessary, and suppressing political dissent. And with North and Poindexter and Casey, you had a group of people who saw Americans who disagree with them as the enemy. Colonel North, in your work at the uh, NSC, were you not assigned at one time to work on plans for the continuity of government in the event of a major disaster? Mr. Chairman. I believe that question touches upon a highly sensitive and classified area, so may I request that you not touch upon that, sir? I was particularly concerned, Mr. Chairman, because I read in Miami papers and several others that there had been a plan uh, developed by that same agency, a contingency plan in the event of emergency that would suspend the American Constitution. And I was deeply concerned about it and wondered if that was the area in, in which he had worked. I believe yeah, that it was. Yeah, I most, I to get yeah, I most respectfully request that that matter not be touched upon at this stage. If we wish to get into this, I'm certain arrangements can be made for an executive session. And tragically, the only member who got close was Jack Brooks, and he was stopped by the chairman. But the truth of the matter is that, yes, you do have those standby provisions, and the plans are there, and the statutory uh, emergency plans are there, whereby uh, you could, in the name of uh, stopping terrorism, apprehend, invoke the military, and uh, arrest Americans and hold them in detention camps. If the president ordered a direct strike into Central America, which was to be codenamed Operation Night Train. We got the documents on it. That they would set up a concomitant domestic readiness exercise or war game scenario called Rex 84. The main rationale of which was to round up 400,000 undocumented Central American aliens within a two week period of time and incarcerate them in 10 military detention camps. They rehearsed this, but of course, if you were rehearsing the rounding up of half a billion aliens, you have also rehearsed uh, the rounding up of half a million critics of the uh, administration. It would be very, very wrong to think 
that these kind of illegal operations will stop just by Ali North's disappearing because uh, the motives to generate these kind of agendas are still there. And the powers that were collected in his name, his office, as far as I know, they are still there. In times of passion and in times of great fear, what to the uh, eyes of the person and the mind of a person in time of relative peace and stability seem impossible, become very real, very logical, very possible. One of the most threatening developments surrounding these revelations is the use of money raised through illegal activities to influence the American electoral process. There are growing indications that large amounts of offshore money are being funneled to conservative political action committees to mount campaigns against liberal congressmen up for re-election. They have set themselves up as an independent government outside of our country's shores operating out of private corporations with hundreds of millions of dollars at their disposal. And they will not be told no. Not only they won't be told no by individual congressmen, because they will smash them politically. They've moved money into these PACs from offshore to help fund these campaigns against people who don't support their policies. We've come actually full circle where these people over on the Hill are intimidated, that they're afraid of having a whole campaign launched against them in their congressional district. Hey, you know, in the 70s, there was a congressman or two who really stood up to the CIA. There was Congressman Pike, uh, who brought out a very, very critical report on what the CIA had been doing. And that man was destroyed. His report never even got to Congress. I mean, there was Senator Clark, for example, of the Clark Amendment, which stopped operations in Angola prohibit the CIA from operating there. A lot of money came into his state in the next election. They said it was South African money. Who knows? And he was defeated. Senator Church, who led the overall critique of CIA operations, a lot of money came into his state of Idaho in the next election, and he was defeated. So congressmen can see who has the power and who has the money in these things. and. Every now and then, one or two of them will stand up and oppose them, but they need an awful lot of encouragement from the people before they're going to take on such powerful enemies. Do you think the Iran-Contra scandal will have an effect on future government operations? No, I think it will be more the same. I don't think that it's going to have much of an effect at all. I just think that they'll be more careful next time. They will continue to carry on covert operations. I think this has been going on forever. They make laws which are for us that they don't seem to be able to, uh, they don't apply them to themselves very often. And who is going to inhibit them? The gangsters that are running this country is going to inhibit somebody. What's happening here, my friends, is a major deception, a major deception which is in process as we stand and talk tonight. A major deception in the same way that the Warren Commission was a major deception worked upon the American people. The same way that the Watergate investigation was a major deception worked upon the American people. Just like the bombing, the secret bombing of Cambodia was kept secret and was a deception worked upon the American people. How long, how long are we going to stand for being deceived in this manner? We will have to make a decision as a country, both Congress and executive, that we will not tolerate this kind of activity and we will go after the perpetrators. These people do have faces when we talk about the shadow government or we talk about the secret team. It's not something totally amorphous. These people are identifiable and can be brought to justice. Assassination, drug smuggling. If they had pursued that line of questioning, uh, they would have soon gotten themselves into a position where they would have had to impeach someone. They could track that right back into the White House. They could put it at least right, un right under the nose of Ronald Reagan. This is the major constitutional crisis since the Civil War. You have a president who is unaccountable and says that uh, it's his interpretation of what laws he'll select to obey. When you have that, you have a constitutional crisis. And all of these things that have been alleged for years and have been speculated and have been charged and have been consistently denied are being confirmed. And these documents have shown 
uh, an incredible array of efforts, all of which were denied to Congress repeatedly uh, and flat out lies by top members of the administration and by the president. It is not uh, a CIA gone wild or a secret government operating it on its own. It's a group of people doing things with the authority of and the, at the direction of the White House. Covert operations have never done this country any good. They may be of momentary advantage to the people who are in power at a particular moment, but in terms of the interests of this country as a whole, they have proven disastrous. There isn't a single one in 30 years that you can point to and say, well, that was one that we are now more secure, better off, and happier as a result of. Every one of them has in its own way contributed to the deterioration of security in the world that we live in. And so it's really time to stop them. Instead of operating within rules and law, we have been supplying lethal weapons to terrorist nations, trading arms for hostages, involving the U.S. government in military activities in direct contravention of the law, diverting public funds into private pockets and secret unofficial activities, selling access to the president for thousands of dollars, dispensing cash and foreign money orders out of a White House safe, accepting gifts and falsifying papers to cover it up, altering and shredding national security documents lying to the Congress. Now, I believe that the American people understand that democracy cannot survive that kind of abuse. There was a time when ignorance made our innocence strong.